So my name is Anastasia Kazakova. So I'm from the company named JetBrains. So we have a booth just opposite the room. So um, if you want to talk about what we do, just better come to the booth. I will try to make some general talk here. Um, so let me briefly tell about my background so that uh, you all know who I am actually. Um, so I was doing C and C++ for eight years in production, mostly working in embedded area, doing some network protocols, like some algorithms for real-time congestion in networking and all the stuff. Um, I then moved to JetBrains to some like unusual role for me because I'm officially called a product marketing manager doing something between evangelism, marketing, product management, I don't know how to call all this stuff properly. So, but I have some official title, which is PMM, so some people are frightened sometimes looking at the marketing world there in between. But I am a C++ developer, um, and that's my background. So I live in St. Petersburg in Russia. I actually run my own C++ user group there. So if you are by chance in St. Petersburg, you're very welcome to come to the user group, and I'm most Welcome to come and speak at my user group. I like international speakers. I like people coming, and I like our community in St. Petersburg benefit from like people from other countries coming and speaking. So we're quite big. We are 700 members, and we're usually from 70 to 100 at each meetup. So just you'll get a huge room, like full of lots of C++ developers, very experienced, very interested in what we all are doing. So here I'm going to talk about debug C++ without running, I'm not sure the naming is accurate enough because I'm not going to talk about the regular debugging and I'm not going to come to the stage when you compile the code. I will stop before that. I will try to share how we could debug in some way the code without even compiling or preprocessing or coming to further stages. So, and I will try now to explain what actually all this thing is about. So this is the short agenda. So we'll start with some tricky C++ examples. And some of you may have heard that I already did like two talks uh, on some similar topics. Um, I'm a little bit keen on talking about languages and tools and how they interact and how we as a tool vendors are looking at the language and what the language means for us and so what like tricky things we see in the language. So I did two talks in a row already um, in 2017. This is somehow the third talk in a row which doesn't require you to listen to my previous talks, but still you could find some similarities if you listen to them. So I will be showing some examples and I will try to explain um, why actually this topic, um, why is it actually here. So. Uh, I will try to explain why I'm talking about this stage before even compiling or reprocessing the code, why, why I'm not moving forward, and why it actually doesn't help sometimes. And I will be showing a bunch of examples from the tooling. I will try to be independent, and I will try to show a variety of tool features, but sorry, you know, I can't get rid of this t-shirt. I'm still from JetBrains. I will be showing a bunch of screenshots from our tools, but there will be other tools on these slides as well, so. And to be honest, that's more or less a dreamer talk. So I'm here not only showing some existing features, but I'm maybe even more dreaming about some good features that we are missing in the tooling. So I encourage all of you to think about what you actually want in this field. And if you're doing a tool, if you're a tool vendor, like, yeah, like we have Savalov here, for example. Yeah, uh, so just think about what value you can add to the tooling, uh, to the tools you are doing. So yeah, let's start with the first part. So, Tricky C++, why I always call it tricky, well, like, I'm a C++ developer, I did C++ for many years, but still, I see some obvious things when the people are calling C++ difficult, and I agree it is, and especially now. So, a very simple example, so, I'm involved in some kind of collaborating with game developers um, right now, and so I see a very interesting thing there, so, if the game developer would like to make a game quickly and easily, they always select Unity and C-sharp. And if I talk to them like, but Unreal Engine with C++ provides you better opportunities, provides you like better stuff, they say, oh, but that's C++. 
and so they are afraid. And many of them jump, just jump off this road at these various stages, learning that that's C++. So that scares them a lot. That just what they, they heard that it's difficult, they believe that it's difficult, and they just come to Unity when they could just throw all the assets in one folder and get a game done. That's it. You don't have to do anything smart there. So also I feel that with the evolution of C++, we get more possibilities, but the language, it, it is actually becoming more complicated in terms of reading, in terms of understanding, in terms of actually keeping an eye on the new features, like, because how many of you here actually understand what is C++ 17, like sign up last year is about in all the details. I get, like, I guess not everyone, because I'm actually not, so I'm honest, like, I, I didn't get all the features to my better, uh, to my good understanding, so, but still. So the current trend is that language is becoming somehow more powerful, but more complicated, and that's actually making the things even more complicated around the language. And so, yeah, I like this quote. I like this link because it actually says that Bjorn really said that, <laughs> and it's on his site. So, but there is a command to this quote on his site as well, saying that, like, that's actually true for all powerful languages, because, like, when you uh, get protected from simple dangers with the help of the language, you get into harder problems, and you're actually missing them because you're not expecting them. You're trying to stay away from the simple dangers, but then you're just running into some harder ones, some unpredictable dangers. And that's true for all the new C++ standards with C++ 11, 14, 17, upcoming 20. So, but I still believe that while Bjorn said it's true for all powerful language, I think it's especially true for C++. Because we have lots of things in our like magic box, we have we have all these things coming from like the previous years, all these like macro help, templates, like all these overloads, things, templates, argument deductions, and we're coming to the world of compile time generation, meta classes, whatever is gonna her bring us in next years. So I've heard yesterday at the booth, someone came to me and said like, but the developers should suffer. Uh, Probably to provide like better software, to be more thoughtful on what we do, to be more accurate, we should, but should we really? So maybe something could help us at least to suffer less, just to, to help us in some situations. So let's just take a quick look uh, at a bunch of C++ examples. So I will be showing you here a few, and actually, uh, my colleague Timur Dombler will be showing a bunch of crazy C++ examples today during the lightning talk. So I like, if you like my examples, I invite all of you to come to his lightning talks. He's just crazy slides going over there. So let's start with a very simple thing, but still I think it's important. So what do you expect here? This is the static assert here, yeah? And it passes in like 98, 11, 14, 17. And if the committee accepts the changes and looks like they are on the way, it won't pass in C++ 12. Um, they are fixing the language, the obvious problem in the language with comparison of these kind of things, uh, and breaking the compatibility, which we never expected, which we relied for that many years, and like saying, like, we are not doing these things because we are keeping the compatibility. So should we really do that for all these years, or should we just go this way and break? But yeah, this is just the first thing. Another thing to example to think about is this nice piece of code. I have a story behind this piece of code, actually. This piece of code was generated by our QA engineer. Um, she was testing, um, oh, I don't want any kind of internet connection. So. Um, she was testing uh, a feature implemented by the developer in the product, and she actually came up with a bunch of C++ examples just to check if the IDE can handle them correctly. So she found an example, she actually filled an issue saying like, this compiles, this works, but the IDE doesn't read it correctly. So, and when we started looking at the example, like the first question from the developer was, but like, yeah, it compiles, but what is actually doing? What is for? So what, what actually happens there? So, yeah, that's a variable template, obviously, we all see that. 
and there is some like call like some instantiation to it. We put it to Compiler Explorer, like as usual we do nowadays, just got built in all our code. Look at that, didn't get any idea at what's going on. And in fact, that's just a game of how the language, how you can write different things in the language, because actually if you go through this path to the very end, that's what's actually happening in this code. You get this some little bit crazy piece in the very beginning, then you realize that that's just this piece with the assignment, and then just calling 42 like int value, like returning it. That's it, that's what all this code is actually doing. Yeah, it's compilable, yeah, it works, but it doesn't make any sense to write this one from the very beginning, but you can do that. And the biggest problem with the language nowadays is that we can write some piece of code that actually makes sense from the standard point of view from the compiler point of view, but it doesn't make sense for us. And the problem is that quite often we do not understand what's actually hidden behind the code. That's why we don't see why this code probably doesn't make sense, or doing something wrong, or not just not doing what we are expecting from this piece of code. Because it could be that complicated doing this very simple thing. And these are just the equivalents. Um, another example is like, with all these uh, preprocessor stuff, and with all these kind of uh, ill-formed code that you could still write and use, unfortunately, uh, and you can get something like that. So there is some enum um, defined using this strange file that has some values, and that actually helps to generate some uh, actual options that I will be then checking in the switch operator. The thing is that uh, I don't know what is actually there in the, this txt file, so I don't know how the actual enum looks like until I actually get to this txt file. Moreover, I undefined the x, so the knowledge about what was happening when the actual thing was processed there by this x marker has disappeared because I just undefined that. So the preprocessor probably, yes, so it like it gets you all the proper code while passing this file, but well, if you're just looking at this file in your like text editor ID on your screen, you just don't know what's going on there because you, you don't look at this file. So you have to navigate to this file, you have to check, then you have to actually get um, like, because actually in this file there is some call to this X macro providing some values here, so you could probably guess it by the, by the code underneath, but still, without all this knowledge, without knowledge about what this macro is actually doing, what is there placed in this file, you don't have a knowledge of what's going on in the code, what are the enum values, are you missing some, or are you not? It's good if the compiler or the tooling is actually helping you, saying, hey, you missed the, like, you know, the, uh, the case value. Let me, like, generate it for you, or let me just say that what are you actually missing. But if the tool is not doing that for you, you could easily miss it. Um, and that's not good. That's not good that you might read, like, write the code and doesn't have any kind of tooling support that is helping to deal you with this kind of situation. Another example of uh, how we could hide the code behind some entities in the language, again, macro. Um, you know, this is some crazy thing going on here. So I have the class declaration happening here inside some macro, and there is also a function declaration happening inside some other macro. So in the end, yeah, I got some classes declared here, like class A, class B, and class C. But to get this, I have to go through all these macros to understand how they actually pack in all the arguments, how they print in this, and how they get actually this text substitution. So the information actually, it's hidden there, so it's not in the like actual file before the preprocessor run. So we have to deal somehow with these definitions, and so we have to find this macro definition to get the knowledge of. Uh, what's actually behind this class def call. Um, my favorite example about the context, I use it for probably all three talks <laughs> that I did uh, during the last year. So, and this is the example about some magic context. You know, like ACCU, to, sorry, 
ACCU um, topic for this year is like magic. Like we had some magic yesterday, but that's also magic in our real C++ world. So you don't know what's actually happening in this outer K assign something line until you know what is actually X. Like is it an integer or is it a type? because this is either an expression or a template. And to know that, you have to go to this foo.h file, you have to know the value of the magic, you have, you have to know which branch is actually active at this very step of your, I don't know, somehow debugging or like, when you debug, you more or less know what's happening. But what if you're just reading the code before actual compilation? Um, let's move from macro to the, like, to the nice bright world that is coming, that's the example from Herb Satter's meta class presentation. Just the basic example that he's actually sh uh, usually showing about uh, shape interface. And it's like a nice example how the meta class could help you, like you can write the short example on top, then some meta class code will process. Uh, because it has some definition on the interface and will generate you the proper shape struct with all the um, like all the members uh, properly set for for this interface. But if you look at the code and you're usually looking at the card on top, so you have somehow to guess that in the end, after the compilation, you get this struct. So and it would be great if the tooling could help you to understand what's actually going on there. Um, another example is like, I will be talking here about the overloads and the overloads itself, like it's not a very complicated thing, but there is always some buts. Like if you overload an operator and you could overload an operator, nearly every operator with some limited exceptions, what's actually happening is that you see some regular sign like in your text editor, and it's not doing probably what you're expecting from it. Because like here I overloaded the operator, and in this last line, half of these operators are regular, half of them are overloaded. But like they look the same. How should I know that they are actually doing something different? So how should I know that half of my symbols on my screen are not doing what I am expecting? How should I guess that the plus is not actually a plus or whatever, or the shift is not actually, the shift or output is not actually the output? So I need a tooling that will help me to guess what's actually going on there behind this operator because I can't rely on that, on the fact that it's doing some regular thing. Um, talking about the overload resolution again, so like, as I said, it's not a complicated thing. It's just a bunch of rules that you have to follow to get the result. But if you're like just, a, you're, we, are, we all are humans, so we can't read like a thousand of lines of code and match all these arguments and all these, like do this, all this name look up in our head quickly. We, we could miss some things, we could like maybe um, miss some like declaration that is some other file or we just do some other uh, strange thing. So uh, here the result is like it's obvious for a compiler and it could be obvious for us if we somehow process this bunch of lines to understand that the output will be two and two. But like, you know, we have all this like the whole slide full of code lines, we have to process it somehow, we have to match the arguments to understand what's actually going on there to find out that the both calls will just print two on my screen. And what I want from tooling is I actually want my tooling to help me with that, to do that job for me. Because I'm not, I'm not a computer, I'm not processing all my code in my head. I'm not like, some people probably have the C++ compiler in, in their head, I don't. So sorry, so I need, I need a tooling support. Um, you're happy if you do. <laughs> and we'll get more, so we're getting const expert, and that's actually the thing that is 
hiding a lot from us because we're getting some branches from, like excluded at compile time. We need to understand which branch was actually selected and we'll get some reflection, some injected code. So we'll get more and more things that are actually coming on stage only after the compilation. So you can't get them on the stage before the compilation. Come on, what's, like that's the Wi-Fi jumping on me. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's think about why the regular tool doesn't help. And that's actually quite obvious. So what we have in our like regular, like we have like run and debug or some static and dynamic card analysis. So with run and debug, the situation is very simple. So you either uh, like jumping in this cycle of running, fixing, running, maybe running and printing something uh, from your code or debugging it step by step. But there, there are actually a problem. So first of all, the compilation could take quite a long. So you may be not in the position when you can wait for your code to compile, to recompile it. Uh, you just need to debug it quickly. You probably need to deploy it somewhere to run it. It's not like the situation when we always can just take our local machine, compile the code quickly and run it. Some, sometimes you need to, to do some installation, some deploy steps. The target platform might be different from your local machine. So it might be not possible at all to run your code at your local machine. The code base might be incomplete. It might be just a library. You may be not having a full application that you can just start. You might be just looking at the library code. And so, like, there could be some flows in logic. So, like, if we're talking about static and dynamic code analysis, they are good. They could catch some bugs. They could uh, help you with some probably flowing logic, but they can't catch everything. And moreover, they doesn't provide you the understanding. They can catch potential issues, but they don't, they actually don't help you, don't explain the code to you. So the explanation of the code is not their goal. Their goal is just to catch issues. And like, th this is important. So that's why I'm saying that these tools don't always help with the issues that uh, we need to deal with these kind of abstractions. And talking about the abstractions, actually, this talk, this idea of this talk appeared during the Herb Sarder's keynotes at CPPCon when he was talking on like for some generative C++ about his meta classes and other stuff. And he said that uh, these abstractions that we have currently in the language, they are hiders and they are like hiding some useful information from the developer. And these abstractions, they need tools that will help developers to see the code behind these abstractions. And I'm very happy that uh, at least Herb thinks that good abstractions do need to be toolable, because otherwise it's just the nightmare happening for the tools that when they can't help you anyhow with these abstractions. And I think that these kind of like tools that are helping with these abstractions are important for the language itself because this is the only way to help uh, with the adoption of the new language features. So if there is a tooling that is helping you with dealing with these abstractions, then that means that this feature will come into real life easier and quicker just because the tooling is helping here. And I'm extremely happy that the committee now has the tooling evolution group, uh, which is exactly for that. They exactly evaluating the new language features, thinking about the tooling behind, because they are all from tooling. We are also in that group, so we are also present there, and we're also thinking about like if this feature is actually toolable, if we could provide some better tooling for these kind of abstractions. And as I said, the talk started with Herb slides, and this is actually a like full copy pass from Herb slide. This is his slide. Thank you, Herb, <laughs> for that. That's just a great list of features he like posted at CPPCon, and I will. Need, I actually plan to like get more to this list, but. I like this list. This is, was the very, the very beginning of my effort on how we could make the new like features toolable and how we could help these abstractions to become less hiders. So let's move to the tooling. Um, let's start with some macros. 
Macro is a hell, but we still have to deal with them. We all do macros, like. If you are not doing a macro, just raise your hand if you don't do macros. You do? All you do? Oh, one person, you are the happiest one. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, we all unfortunately do macros. We all have to deal with these tax substitutions. We all have to somehow struggle with that. Um, so there are a couple of things that could help and which exist in the current tooling, which you could use right now. And so these are very tiny and easy things, but still, the very first thing here is just to ask the tool to show you the final replacement. And so some tools can do that. This is the screenshot from our C line. So you just call some something like in C line is quick documentation window, but like you call some action and you get the final replacement for your macro. So you could just in one action you can see what's actually behind that. So there is a very good thing, you don't need to change your code. So you just call some IDE action and it shows you what's actually behind so you don't need to change because when you change you always forget to revert some things then you put some crazy stuff occasionally to the repository that just the part of your debugging process but still so you just look at this macro uh, look what is going on there you don't change the code you don't change the semantics you don't do anything you don't touch you just view and that's a separate view and so you just get the final, very final replacement to see what's, what is actually there in the very end. But there are like other things. Um, you can, in some tools, you can substitute next step. Uh, this is the screenshot from ReSharper C++. Uh, when you can just call an action, and this is the same piece of code, so I just substituted this first uh, class def A macro call, and so it just gets me what's actually going after the first substitution. So, and what I can do, I can do just a debug, so-called debugging step by step. So I can substitute step by step to see how it actually changes. The good thing is that I can stop at any point because with the final replacement, the problem is that probably I don't need the final replacement. There could be some library macro calls that I don't want to see what's actually there in the very end. I know what. I know exactly what this macro call is doing. So when substituting step by step, you can always just make a stop at every point. You can change some things at every point and then continue. So um, yeah, and as I said, sometimes you just don't need a final replacement. You can stop at any point and say like, yeah, I got what's going on here. I can proceed with my code. Um, I will show later one thing that you should be careful about, but let's postpone it for a couple of slides later. And uh, let me show you the substitution of all steps. So like the same thing that happened when I just got the final replacement, you can just ask your tool, this is again the ReSharper C++ screenshot. So you can just substitute everything until the very end and see what's actually going on there, just to speed up your debugging process. So you were going step by step and then just decided, no, I just want to go to the very end to see what's actually going on there. Uh, so in one step, in one click, you just get the whole stack unwind in, this, in the sense of the macro. Um, some practical example for actually this thing, because there was some artificial example with macro probably, you don't believe in it, but that's, some kind of real example, you have a boost macro, which is a huge thing calling one, like they are calling each one, one by one, there is a huge tree happening there. What if you're just trying to understand what these boost macro are actually doing behind this short name? So you can go this way, so there is an example when I'm just trying to substitute step by step and I can just get to this line in the end or just substitute everything and get this line immediately. So I will see how all these like actual definitions are appearing step by step in my code. So that's a good way to just to investigate what the macro is doing. Um, I said that you should be careful with that things and I would like to show you an example here. So let's assume we have the example the thing is that substituting this kind of macro might affect the code. And the thing is that, assume we have a counter macro, a line macro, 
And if we start substituting the things, we can get into this situation. So I substitute the second call. I got this V1 variable. And that means that on the third line, the new var now comes with the counter equal to one. So I have two doubled declarations here. So which is a compiler error, so which is just highlighting by the, highlighted by the two link for me. So anyway, the idea is that if you substitute things, uh, like in a real code, not just previewing the final replacement, but substitute, you have to think that you might be, need to be careful because you might have macros that are affected by the substitution like this counter or line when you get not the code that was there before you started substituting. Because after I substituted the, line, the second line, the third line get changed from what I had actually before. Um, talking about macro debug, um, like we always uh, get lots of requests on how to deal with navigation in macro. And I believe many people think that that's a very easy thing. You can easily navigate for macros, but the macros are just text. And that makes some things even more complicated because it's always nice when you can navigate to proper usage to find proper things. And in this, for example, if you, um, yeah, if you put, a, uh, put your cursor on this func m uh, macro definition, put, uh, put it to the func, and call the go to declaration. Um, for example, this is this screenshot from Eclipse. It founds nicely uh, all the options you can go to, but it misses one, I guess you can see. Because like this is a macro, you can just, this is just text. You can have this piece of code like int func that I have in the very end of my, uh, of my macro definition function and it misses it. So with the definition, go to go into declaration, like navigation inside macros, many tools cope quite well so they can like see, show you all the options you have and you have to decide where you're going. Uh, but sometimes they are missing some things because that's not that obvious. So and sometimes the tool just rejects to do that at all because of this fact. Um, yeah, so Let's move forward. Let's move from macros to type. Type information debug. Like uh, before outer and decal type like appearance, we probably lived in a very happy C++ world with all the types written directly in our like screen and we always can uh, just find out what the type is actually, uh, what type is actually used. So. The type information debug is actually has a clear goal of understanding what type is actually behind the like the variable. Um, so and for tooling, this is actually the not the easiest task, but like it should be the easiest task because actually, uh, if you get the proper AST for your code base, then it's like not a problem to infer a type and to show it in one or another way to the to the developer, and actually the, tool, the tooling, um, the tools uh, do that. So, for example, if we have this piece of code, and I would like to know the type of the uh, op variable, so plenty of tools can do that. So I have a bunch of screenshots here from different tools, like Visual Studio, Eclipse, our tools. So they all can infer the type properly, they all can show double for you. Like if you change 3.0 to just free, they will infer int for you on the fly. Everything is working fine, so you can always ask the tools. They are just different in what action you should call in the tooling, like to get this type. But they all can do that for you. And that's great that we can actually know the type. Um, another thing that you can try and use is actually the same thing that we did with macro. So we were debugging macro by substituting it step by step. Let's do the same. Let's just try and substitute type tabs step by step or just to the uh, very final uh, type. So and this is some kind of a practical example as well. So I'm trying to understand actually the type of high without deep knowledge of what boost MPL is actually doing. And so, yeah, I could go and substitute the type there and I could come to this path 
and finally got the D type for, for my high. So um, this is actually the screenshot from ReSharp C++ that can do that, like substituting type def in the same way it substitutes the macros for you. Um, okay, so we talked about type information debug. Now let's talk about the uh, some meta information debug. And so debugging the abstractions is a very complicated thing. So. And I would say that we don't have a lot of proper tools doing that right now. And that's the place where I will be dreaming a lot. So, but I will start with some working things and then move to some big dreams. So debugging the abstractions, there are a few important things. So instantiating templates, uh, evaluating const texper, and evaluating like all this injected stuff. So with uh, instantiating templates, so the tools nowadays more or less cope, so they can find you what's the actual, like what was the actual template that was instantiated. Uh, like this is the screenshot from Cvelop, like thanks Peter, that's really a great thing that just shows you a separate window and showing you what actual types were substituted so how the selection, how the choice was actually made for this piece of code, so how, how it was uh, calculated in the compiler brain. Um, but this is good, but what we currently actually missing is any kind of tool that will help us with const expression evolution and some decisions based on that. So the tool that I'm perfectly dreaming about is the tool that you can point to any kind of const expert uh, thing and it will just calculate all the thing and shows you the, the active branch. For example, if in this code, I would like to go through this get value call, uh, like jump to my get value function and see a proper branch highlighted to me in that case. That would be great. So uh, I know that uh, in KDevelop, they have these things for template instantiation. Uh, at least I've heard about it. I honestly didn't manage to get it work on my own, but I like, wrote a bunch of articles about how they do that. So then when you go from the actual template instantiation to the template, and then they show the completion based on the information from where you actually came from. That's the thing that I actually want to do here. So I would like to come from get, from get value to this uh, get value uh, function there, and I would like to get to a proper branch of my context, or at least highlight it in somehow. But honestly, I don't know tools doing that, and I really hope that we could get some tools for that, because this is really crucial for us to work with context per stuff so that the tools can show us. Um, Okay, so let's back to the real world, to so the tools that we still have, so that you, you have some tools in your pocket. So, overloads. So, there are a few ways of dealing with overloads in the current tools, at least what I know about it. So, dealing with the operators. So, as I said, when looking at the operator, I actually would like to know if that's a regular operator or if it's doing something different, if it's overloaded, actually. So um, this is the screenshot from C-Line, which can actually highlight you the actual usages, find the usages uh, of the operator. So when you put a cursor on one of these operators, you see that not all, not all of them were highlighted because exactly those that are overloaded were highlighted. I just jump on that. So uh, the tooling here could just highlight, could show the usages of your overloaded operators and could just go to declaration. So if you just put a cursor to this operator and you just press some shortcut that navigates you to the declaration, you're jumping to this overloaded code, like to the code that overloads this operator. That's the good thing to deal with this kind of stuff. So probably there, there might be some other ways to work around that, maybe highlight them in some different way, but I think we'll run out of colors if we try to highlight all the things we overload. But still, that could be a possible workaround as well. Um, 
talking about the regular like function overloads. So that's quite a simple process actually happening there. So uh, how the compiler works, so it does the name lookup, it does all this template argument deduction thing, it picks the candidate, so it builds the set, it picks the candidate from this set, and then it just checks the uh, access control rules like if the function was not deleted, if it's visible by the access control rules, all that stuff. So how we could actually debug that, how we could, at the point when we are looking at the function, how we could actually understand why and what was actually selected there. So these kind of tools that are explaining the overload resolution are really a crucial thing. So what I know for now is the way you can try and ask your tools to at least show all the options in terms of all the parameter sets that you can get. So this screenshot on the left is from Visual Studio. It's maybe, it's good, but for me it's not that expressive because you have to list through, through all, the, all the overloads, which is not very convenient because like it might be eight like here or it might be like 10,000. Um, some other way to do that is just to show all the parameter sets uh, in one list, somehow highlighting if it fits or not in that case, because like the tool can also deduce this kind of information if that uh, overload is more or less fitting, so highlighting you what you can add. Like, like um, here it's highlighted me in bold what I actually have in the argument list and highlighting me also in like gray what I can add there. Uh, nearly the same thing uh, like from Visual Studio and from Eclipse uh, and ReSharp C++ here that shows not only the function signature but also a documentation which makes the thing a little bit easier because you not only see the function signature with all the arguments available but you also see the function documentation that might explain something to you at this first stage. Um, the thing that I'm probably missing and that I don't know any tool doing that is to provide me some additional explanation to that. So apart from just showing me these sets, try to explain somehow why this actually was selected. Because it, I might run into the situation that not a proper function was selected. And I need to understand why. So I need not only to detect that not a proper function was selected, but I need to understand why it actually happened. It's good when I might, when I actually deduce that from this uh, template, like from this, sorry, uh, arguments information, like looking at the parameter info information and understanding that, oh yeah, so I just missed up some parameter types and that's why it's actually taking another candidate. But in the situation, it might be the situation that that's not enough. And so I probably need some information at least about like uh, accessibility, about if the function was deleted or some additional things that might uh, affect the decision here. Um, one cool uh, thing that I would like to show, and that's probably, uh, let me try to run it, the, the only animation in this slide. <laughs> that's actually some prototype that's not a real product, that's just a toy prototype that our developer made in terms of going to similar functions. So in like if you have this kind of overload resolution and you just messed up with some argument set, what if a tool can try and guess where you actually want to be? So just try and help you to fix your issue. So um, that's what we call like going to similar function that didn't make it to production, that's just a prototype. It, I believe it fails in many cases, but that's a good idea actually behind that the tooling can help you to guess where you actually might want to go instead of where are you now. Sorry. Um, so yeah, let's move forward. So from this overload stuff, a little bit to the um, includes and includes profiling. So I like ran into this article with the help of my team, which was like actually explaining this uh, blow up factor hell when you, when you start the project and it's quite small and the, you are adding more files to your project, you are adding more uh, libraries, you are adding more headers, you are adding more includes, 
you forget to clean them up, you forget just that you added this thing in another header file, and finally you are running into the situation where this blow-up factor grows, and the blow-up factor is the total, line, total number of lines you actually wrote deleted on the total number of lines actually parsed. And the parsed means that like after you substitute all your includes, and then you get your final code that's actually processed by the compiler, by the parser, and so this is the blow up factor. And it grows, that's just a fact. And there are a couple of uh, tools and techniques that help us to deal with that. And like there is an obvious thing like precompile headers, like which saves a huge amount of our like compilation time when you just compile the header once and just use it everywhere, just not plug in it uh, where it includes everywhere. But what if you already have the code base like that and you can't just move to precompile headers or so? So there are like a couple of interesting things here. So first of all, uh, I will show you this thing called like some kind of includes profiler, that's the feature implemented in ReSharp C++, which is actually showing you what is the contribution of the header files here, including in terms of uh, lines of numbers uh, and inclusively with all the headers included in all these headers here included in a current file. So, and you can actually sort it by these contribution value and to see where you're actually getting real huge number and trying to find out if you really want that. And the good thing is that there are tools that are doing this more or less automatically in terms of improving this, uh, um, like include hell, is I call them optimizers. So there are a bunch of techniques here. So first of all, like many tools actually shows you unused includes so all major IDEs actually do that, so they show you that this include is probably unused. Um, there is a tool called include what you use, and so as far as I know, uh, so in Google reported that they improved the compilation time by 40% with the help of this tool, and that's great, like 40% compilation time, really. Um, and so what it does, it actually like, yeah, marks the includes that are not uh, actually needed and it's capable of replacing includes with forward declarations. Uh, and uh, yeah, another tool is uh, Includator, uh, so which does nearly the same. So it's very similar in terms of functionality. So it's uh, a plugin for Eclipse. So, and it can also like marks the unused includes and replace the includes uh, with the forward declarations which actually reduces the physical dependencies. So, yeah, and that's actually mostly it in terms of what we have now. So, these are the couple of references I was using during the presentation, so just if you would like to grab some more links and go from there, so feel free, yeah, to take a picture. <laughs> Uh, or you can find these links in the slides at official ACCU GitHub page. So, and questions? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yep? The first thing I picked up is, yes, I've got some of these tools. I have no idea they could do this. Yeah, so I will repeat for the recording, like the command was that people are using these tools but they have no idea that these tools have these features. That's a regular problem for all the tools. Like our users, like we did some extensive researches and it shows that our users are usually using less than 40% of our features. Like we do a lot of smart stuff but they are mostly like using a couple of the features we provided. They're mostly not aware of other things. That's why we're here with the booth. That's why we're talking a lot. That's why we have people like me who like likes talking 24 hours a day, showing people the features that we really have because otherwise we'll end up with 30% of the features used and all our job just throw into the basket. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I 
I, I tried to find that when I first read, read the article, <laughs> to be honest. I like the graph, like I like how it grows. I was like, that was the first thing that actually, um, while I was preparing the presentation, like my husband was sitting near to me, he said, what is the FML? I, was, I said, like, I have no idea. I searched for all the researchers. I have some uh, guess, but I will not say them publicly. I don't think that's appropriate. And I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess that's some impression of how it grows. <laughs> yeah, but like you can rep um, like ask the authors <laughs> what they actually meant there. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the question was about tooling for all these context per matter stuff, if it's scary or not. If it is, like, it is scary, because to be honest, to deal with it properly, we have to do the full C++ interpretation inside the tool before the actual call into the compiler. And it is scary, because you have to do the same job as a compiler quickly enough so that you are not waiting for like your completion appearing for like half an hour. Um, like quickly enough, effectively and correctly, uh, and it is scaring, and I would say that we are trying a little bit to stay away from it. We understand that it's necessary, but all our attempts like, oh, we have to interpret the C++. But we will do that sooner or later. You know, we can't escape from that world. So we all will do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the, the hero. <laughs> okay, when are you going to show this to us? In which year? <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully Peter will show, show that things to us sooner or later. Yeah, we can, we can ask him. <laughs> okay, yeah. Ah, I was waiting for that question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, let me try to answer. So the question was if we're using leap clank or not. That's my favorite question about the tooling because like, yeah, honestly speaking, lots of tools nowadays are using leap clank. The problem with the leap clank is that's a perfect and accurate parser, and that's the thing that we can't like overcome with what we do. But the thing is that um, sorry. Uh, the thing is that it's not perfect in terms of IDE performance and like the ability to plug it in easily in the IDE, because that's a compiler. It does other things, so it doesn't have this kind of like postponed resolve stuff because it tries to resolve the symbol when it just sees it because that's a compiler. And our IDE job, as I, I, I tried to explain it in the previous two talks quite accurately, that we try to postpone the things to the very late moment before, like to the moment when you really need that because otherwise uh, our job from the IDE point will be very slow. You won't like survive, you will just go to the text editor because you don't want to wait for a completion stuff for like half a minute. You need it right now. So we are still investigating how the things in the leap clank going. We're still looking at various opportunities like clank D, leap clank. We're still experimenting with that. We have uh, like honestly speaking a couple of prototypes based on that. We're still comparing them with our own engines in terms of performance and accuracy. Of course, Leap Clang is, and Clang is perfect in terms of accuracy, but it's not perfect in terms of performance. It, do, it still misses lots of things uh, because we can't push all our functionality on it, like refactorings that are working on the whole project are not possible. Um, like at least right now, so we have to do still a big job. So we are still investigating and comparing the prototypes, trying to understand which way to go next. Should we have one, another, or maybe both, or maybe combined? We don't have an answer yet, but we hope to have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so just repeating the question for the recording. So if language is adding a new feature, the compilers are adding a new feature to language, yes, the link that is not using libclang or clang uh, has to implement 
that on their own. Like every compiler has to implement the feature, the tooling has to implement the feature. So yes, we do that. So that's why we are like, for example, we are not done with C++ 17 for now because we have still a lot of things to do uh, in front of us. And yes, we have to implement features one by one on our own engine, at least until we are not moved to any like community stuff like Clank. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the first. Uh, the question was about the compiler extensions. So um, our general feeling about the tool that the tool should always behave the same way like your compiler. So it always should behave the same way like your currently selected compiler behaves. That's a complicated task. That's why we take all the information from the compiler and grabs uh, all our knowledge about these compiler extensions and try to parse the code with this knowledge. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we probably fail, but yeah, at least we, we try to do that. Because that, that's a thing that you're expecting from the tool, that it behaves the same way as your compiler. There is a quite a complicated story when you come to cross-platform debug cross-compilation because you're on one platform, you're expecting <coughs> other things, but still we're trying to do that and still try to follow the compiler path in that case. Yeah, so the question was about actual some kind of a testing of the over lower resolution stuff and so if it's really helpful or not because there are a bunch of ways to do that. So uh, like the sad story is that we're not dog fooding our tools a lot. So we have some teams who are using like our tools inside the team. We have lots of like a huge user base that's actually using our tools. We have early access program which actually exist especially for that, for the people to try the new features and to say to us like, no, it's not working, no, that's not the way you should do that. And then we go and change. Because we try to rely on our like testing, we have like queer engineers, we have C++ developers in the team who has some experience, like who, like, who has some background, who has some knowledge, and who can advise something, but it's like the process when we rely on our experience, but then ask the community. That's why we have this EAP program, just to ask people about what you actually think about our implementation. Does it fit your needs? Does it fit your process? And if we get some really negative feedback, like, no, it's not working, we are really going and re-implementing the thing that happened to us, like, quite many times. So we are trying to listen more to the C++ community than like relying only to our experience because we are just like less than 20 people in the team. We are not speaking for all the projects, for all the variety of the C++ developers. Yeah, so you track is the major channel for us, like you should track her which actually incorporates all the feature requests, all the commands from our users. We have other channels, like uh, people here might like meet me every day in our Twitter because I'm the person behind the C-Line ID Twitter. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm trying to answer to all commands in our blog. Uh, we have support engineers who are handling uh, requests coming to support. We have forum, we have dozens of other chats, like we have uh, lots of people trying to handle commands on Reddit and Stack Overflow and ESO or CPP blog, like Twitter or somewhere. So we try to listen to the community. That's the major point for the whole chat brains because we believe that we are the developers, but like we believe that the community actually knows how to do the things and we have to listen to it. Yep, so more questions? Okay, so you can catch me still at the booth and ask more questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you.